I'm going to uh, go ahead and, uh, and begin. Uh, let's see, we're already at five after eight. So uh, welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Jack Glassman. I am a historical, my day job, historical architect for the National Park Service Regional Office. Uh, I'm chair of the committee since way back in 2012. And uh, so uh, happy, uh, happy May. It's uh, May is National Preservation Month. Um, lots of activities, um, with, including uh, in Boston, uh, great sources, the Preservation Alliance. Uh, and let, go to their website and they've got uh, still May days left. Uh, and, and Jack, I think you're muted. Oh. Okay. I'm, I'm hearing you, Jack. Oh, all right. <clears throat> Maybe it's just I'm not speaking loudly enough. But uh, let me know if, uh, yeah, let me know if, uh, if it is a problem for some. <clears throat> I can hear you, Jack. You're muted, Jack. All right. I probably was uh, speaking too softly in any case. But uh, yeah, so May, so Preservation Month, it's also uh, nationally, it's uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and uh, Pacific Island are. Uh, Islander Heritage Month, so that there are also uh, things to learn about and to uh, and to do. I uh, just wanted to take a moment to remember uh, preservation architect, um, a friend of our preservation community, and uh, and especially at Goody Clancy, Dilver Hosek, passed away suddenly at the end of April. Um, surrounded by friends and family, I, I hear. Um, but um, uh, I didn't do, get a chance to sort of work with her specifically on a project, although I know of her reputation of working on Trinity Church and other important projects, uh, Betty Clancy. Uh, and I knew her through the APT, the Association for Preservation Technology, the Northeast uh, chapter. Uh, she was a board member and always involved in the, uh, the activity of the events and the programs. And so, when I would see Jill, when I'd arrive at one of these uh, reception or a tour or something, I'd know I'd, I'd arrived at the event. So um, she will she will be missed. Um, as I traditionally do, just wanted to share uh, uh, some items I think of interest, historic uh, interest to historic resources locally and globally. So let's just uh, dive right into that. Um, noted the passing of uh, Leo Marx. Uh, I wrote in here professor, but then I saw that the, in the Globe uh, story said that he really had no use for uh, that sort of title. But uh, I'm showing a picture of my yellowed paperback from, from college. I don't know if it was freshman or sophomore year, <laughs> uh, or like urban sociology class. But um, uh, I, I remember I was fascinated with the machine in the garden. I was fascinated by the sort of the visual, the metaphors, but uh, uh, he uh, was one of the pioneers, I guess, and uh, you know, a historian of, of uh, history of technology uh, and writing about these sort of dueling uh, uh, philosophies, I guess, of uh, America. But he really, uh, as what the quote says, really helped to define this sort of field of American studies of uh, this. Uh, as the, the nation was trying to struggle with, you know, what does it mean? What does America, what will it be? And what does it mean to be? I'm not saying that very well, but uh, I bet Sarah or others could uh, speak on that. He, uh, uh, he wrote that the book in 64 when he was teaching at Amherst College, eventually made his way to, to uh, MIT. Uh, I think he ended his career uh, there. Um, so Jack, if I may, uh, he absolutely made my career. Uh, that was by far the most influential book uh, when I was a student. Uh, and of course, subsequently, my entire career studying American urban history, including my recent book, owes a great debt to Leon, uh, Leo Marx. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I can't say enough about him. Mm. Wow, well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, well, certainly in the news, uh, sad news there about all these uh, accidents that are happening during demolition uh, projects, uh, especially. And so uh, there was a recent piece uh, in the Globe just talking about the 
uh, entitled in bringing buildings down, risks go up, and uh, just talking about the, the dangers. And it makes reference to the OSHA requirements, uh, um, including uh, so-called preparatory operations before starting demolition, uh, engineering surveys, embracing and protecting openings where workers could fall and so on, and how a lot of accidents occur because those are things get lax and those aren't being followed. But um, uh, they did make reference to the, the unknown hazards, the perils that uh, particularly on historic properties where conditions may have shifted or evolved over time and record keeping could be spotty. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's not <laughs> new news, but it's uh, certainly um, they do make reference to the historic properties where there just are the unknowns. One, you know, one uh, ideally you find the original construction documents and uh, or you really undertake to do the concrete uh, to actual testing. Uh, so it's good when that does happen and we, we promote that because it's a part and parcel of many of our, within our community, uh, what we do, the engineers, the preservation engineers. Um, speaking of demolition, um, I read, so uh, the Plymouth Cordage factory, it's now the Plymouth Cordage Park, uh, uh, as a iconic smokestack uh, scheduled for demolition uh, this week. So I don't know if it's already happened, but uh, uh, I just think it's it's sad that um, there there was a study that said it was at risk of falling at any time. They, uh, as the the Globe reported, um, they had a second you know, kind of commission a second opinion. The story they didn't say what that second opinion was, but the town went ahead. Uh, to uh, uh, approve the demolition anyway. So meanwhile, there is this bold kind of redevelopment plan <laughs> for the area. Um, and uh, so that could uh, kind of play into it as well. There may have just been uh, just that interest in having it, having it gone to its prime waterfront real estate, of course. So um, the town says it'll collaborate with the Plymouth Community Preservation Committee on, uh, and the Portage Commerce Center on a way to memorialize the smokestack. But uh, I don't know, just having seen other, you know, eating, this picture you know, show, obviously shows some uh, the main serious issues in fracking at the top, but just wonder whether there could have been some sort of creative alternative where rather than taking the entire thing down, if in fact, that was the worst uh, at the top, as often happens where the weather and the cracking, and it's the smallest cross section. But be that as it may, uh, I guess uh, it's going to be a done deal. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll turn to some better news later. But anyway, the National Press Tech came out with this just a few examples among the 11 most endangered places in the United States uh, list would come out. Um, Includes in the upper right the uh, in Idaho, uh, it's a J Japanese in World War II inter internment camp. I think there were uh, like thirty thousand uh, Japanese Japanese Americans who were interned there. Um, range of structures as they always have. The lower right was a, a, a funerary uh, uh, in Hartford, a nineteenth-century uh, Jewish. Uh, uh, burial facility that's threatened. Uh, turning to some good news, the, uh, the so-called Superman building, a 1928 uh, building in Providence uh, is finally, it's after many years, is vacant for years and years, uh, uh, poised for a uh, mixed use revival. Um, with uh, for commercial uh, 285 units of res residential units, 20% uh, of which would be affordable and 8,000 square feet of commercial office space and retail community, community event space as well. Uh, the city is kicking in grant money uh, and a loan. Uh, High Rock is the, uh, High Rock Development is a Massachusetts-based developer. And I just love that. Uh, Provin's Journal photo from 1954. Uh, more recent picture is the uh, a picture of the interior. Um, the Highland uh, Roxbury Highland Park is finally uh, 
<clears throat> uh, have been proposed many years ago as a architectural conservation district, nothing happened, but now it's been revived and it looks like maybe it will happen now. The, uh, I remember, gosh, it was like in the 1980s, I think it's the Society of Architectural Historians, New England chapter, we had a bus tour going around, uh, including here at Marble Block. And uh, this is funny, you know, all day these folks getting out of a tour bus, <laughs> walking around the neighborhood. And, uh, uh, and for, at least for me, I was thinking, it's beautiful stuff, but nobody, you know, visitors to Boston, no one, no one gets to see and should. But uh, in any case, uh, so uh, architectural conservation district status will certainly give it a little more uh, protection uh, than the uh, longstanding, you know, the honorific, the National Register listing. Uh, so the residents and, uh, and design review, there'll, there'll be a little more attention to preserving the historic character of this neighborhood that has incredible diversity, architectural from from uh, honest to God colonial with the Dillaway Thomas house to this Victorian, uh, uh, lots of different architectural styles. Um, Gary had passed on that news uh, that, that the Noel, the, the Wolf and Siegel Noel building, which later had you know, BKNY down at Karen store, uh, the owners have proposed uh, a jar. What, what, they have proposed an addition to the one-story uh, uh, day, I guess you might call it, but uh, which would, if I'm making it two stories, which kind of uh, really negates the whole and part of the whole idea. So I guess this was an informal proposal at the Landmarks Commission. Uh, it was uh, wasn't formally listed, so maybe one could say it was a trial balloon. Um, so. Uh, Hopefully they would uh, back, back off from that because it's, uh, I don't know if you can call it iconic or whatever, but certainly uh, it's so representative of the diversity within the back bay in the architectural district, but if not a frozen, makes it different from Beacon Hill, for example, uh, with a, quite a blend of, uh, of different styles and, uh, and eras. So we'll see what happens on that one. But, uh, Stay tuned. Uh, well, speaking of facades, uh, the, so the, um, uh, the development team, HM Gorham, uh, Masterworks, uh, Group One Partners. Uh, uh, this was also a proposal uh, for several over the years to either demolish or add on whatever to the Stanhope uh, block. Uh, and so uh, this latest proposal, 21 stories, uh, 300 room hotel. Um, this particular iteration, I guess, first proposed in the fall of 2019 before the pandemic. Uh, but they're they're back and uh, and they have seemed to have worked with uh, uh, a lot of parties to uh, in terms of a setback and preserving and activating the existing uh, facade to be retained. So uh, it certainly it looks like a, an, an interesting. <laughs> Interesting project, but uh, uh, smaller certainly than some of the other uh, the current projects going going up. So in that context, um, and I could see how it really would enliven the area that already has, where it has flower next door and outdoor seating. And so we'll see how that develops. But uh, I guess that they really did uh, take the heart, I guess, touching base with the uh, uh, with the different stakeholders. If anyone has any other information about this or other things, feel free to pipe up. Pipe up. Yeah. Uh, over in New York, uh, Roosevelt Island. Uh, this was kind of an interesting story. The uh, historic smallpox uh, hospital um, that um, has, well, sat vacant for a long time. Uh, it, it was ostensibly, the, so it was, I guess, the kind of the first, um, uh, according to uh, looking at the architect's newspaper article, maybe the, the first hospital that was sort of uh, dedicated, if you will, to a uh, to an epidemic or a pandemic, um, uh, designed by James Renwick, uh, 1856, James Renwick Jr. Um, and um, 
Uh, fast forwarding to, you can see the, the ruin there. There is a group uh, now that's sort of taken over a longstanding battle or, or sort of movement to convert it. Uh, this, uh, the site uh, was planned to be a park. Uh, they wanted it to be uh, you know, just sort of a peace park or that sort of thing, but uh, with, uh, with COVID-19, the pandemic, so that's been, they've kind of honed their message to make it so that it's kind of honor, uh, to make it a, uh, a memorial site to honor uh, the health professionals as well as the, the, the victims, so um, the pandemic. So this was just a one uh, rendering showing the tension of the, uh, the ruin. Uh, the article said that the building, uh, uh, so in the 1950s, there was a school that was abandoned. They said it was eventually granted landmark status at the city, state, and national level, becoming the first, the country's first quote unquote landmark ruin. So I don't know what they, you know, what, how they were backing that up, but uh, if, that's a, if it's a national historic landmark, and uh, there are certainly other ruins that are. But uh, in any case, uh, it's, uh, it's good that this is kind of moving forward in their, uh, their fundraising. Um, finally, uh, just uh, over in York, England, this was a, uh, an interesting uh, new uh, kind of renovation to an 800-year-old uh, tower, uh, showing the new uh, access and waysides. Uh, this was uh, primarily a viewing deck that uh, sort of tied in with uh, so the the deck also protects uh, some of the structure below. Uh, they have it sort of set and you know, set back and it sets down. You can see a little amphitheater, but also so that it won't uh, won't encroach on the uh, <clears throat> from below on the uh, where it meets the sky and overlook the city. Um, the uh, interior stair, I saw there were some uh, kind of letters to the editor where they, they thought that was a bit too in intrusive, too much in there, but uh, uh, obviously they, they're using some of the turrets uh, for egress stairs and then this, uh, this monumental stair, but it's, a, it's kind of an interesting, the shapes, uh, I, I thought this was a nice way to end just with the way the shapes are with our moving in to talk about the, uh, to talk about, the Heinz Center too, these sort of elemental or geometric forms. So um, one thing I didn't mention, but that's uh, worth looking at, it's in my the bibliography, by the way, is Renee Loff uh, did a recent uh, editorial about preservation, preservation looks ahead. And uh, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> it's, it's worth, uh, and it comments on the, uh, the National Trust endangered uh, list and uh, her columns are always interesting. So. Um, with apologies to the, the fifth dimension of the cylinders of hope and their lyrics, uh, um, and Diana Ross actually before that. <laughs> uh, what's next for the Heinz Convention Center? Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, and I'm gonna ask, by the way, uh, Gary, Gary, there you are, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I just couldn't resist showing uh, uh, most of us, I think on the call or know of or are familiar with the the, the famous uh, Noli plan or Noli map of Rome, 1748. Uh, I think it's really considered one of the most famous maps in history. Uh, and, um, and by the way, uh, you might want to look for a cylinder in there in this plan. Um, what I, I guess, uh, and, and so my thought with the, the Heinz conversation was, wouldn't it be wonderful if a back day had something like this? You know, what was groundbreaking, I think, that, you know, the achievement is, of course, that it's showing the public kind of spaces of public accommodation, the alleys, the, the, the streets, but also the interiors, the churches, and, uh, you know, and the squares, all just rendered in this uh, kind of uh, uh, enhanced <laughs> bigger ground showing interior spaces as well as exterior. So uh, I, I think it would be great to see the uh, See the, the whole Heinz complex and that. This was the only thing I found, uh, some, I think a student project I found online and uh, it, it, what it, it's good as far as it goes, I guess it's not an only plan, but it certainly shows the footprint, the massive footprint of the whole kind of complex of the Heinz and the hotels and then going over quartz copy, Prudential and- uh, uh, Hi so, Jack. 
I, I'd be happy to share with some share a a Noli like plan with the group at some point. All right. That's, Since that's we did great. we did produce one previously. All right. That's wonderful. Uh, I'll just start Jack, a couple more also, slides. May, may I also interject just a, a little bit of history. The the re the way in which we appreciate the Noli map is not the purpose for which it was commissioned by the Crown. Uh, hmm. We delight in the fact that it shows public space. It was commissioned to uh, identify taxable areas, which is ex in fact the black rather than the white. And just a little curious a bit of history about the Noli map. Oh. So it's the hatched area that was of importance, not the because that was taxable. A space uh, as opposed to the white, which was public space and therefore not taxable. Oh, hmm. okay. Thank you. So that's a, <laughs> that's interesting. So sort of like the Sanborn insurance maps, uh, they were created for a certain purpose, and yet uh, for historians, uh, we uh, we're we're still very grateful that they exist uh, for studying uh, urban design in this case. So um, I just did find online from Signature Boston, uh, just showing uh, some of the color coding there that does show some of the promenade kind of through in, uh, in the spaces, just as a reminder. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't sure, and maybe we'll talk about it, but what's shown in pink, the, the Veterans Memorial Auditorium, I wondered was there, whether that actually was part of the original Heinz Auditorium, but there, here's a, black and white picture of a UMass uh, commencement from 1971 that looks like it's in that room. So, uh, Gary was kind enough to, uh, Gary Wolf, uh, uh, architect who has had a lot of um, firsthand experience really with some of the, from uh, modern, uh, uh, well-known uh, architects, uh, the so-called five architects and some of the forays into post-modernism and his experience in Princeton. Uh, um, it's a very, has a, a great interest and knowledge of uh, uh, mid-century and beyond uh, architecture. And uh, he sent some uh, images, AMW images. And uh, do you wanna talk about them? Gary. Hi, Jack, thanks. Uh, you could just go ahead and, and um... Uh, sc scroll through those, I think, for people who either have never seen the building or, or may not have been there recently, it would give them an idea. Um, uh, and thanks for setting this up, Jack. I, I think uh, it's, it's valuable. Um, uh, it, it's, I don't want to uh, take much time here, but it's, it's uh, the point I would make is simply that uh, the uh, uh, attention to uh, any building in, in the city or anywhere uh, that's as significant as this building, the attention to it without acknowledging that significance or uh, evaluating its architectural and urbanistic qualities is really uh, something that's fairly irresponsible on the part of, of the client or the developers or the architects, whoever it is. You know, at this point in time, I think in the preservation movement, we expect to have uh, some uh, uh, sensitivity to the, the merits of the building. In this case, for anybody who's not been there, uh, for a convention, uh, you know, the Heinz is a, it's a welcoming, uh, uh, understandable, uh, well-detailed and well-organized uh, uh, building, which uh, is a real delight uh, to, to at attend conferences for, especially if you're out of town, it puts you right in the middle of the city. Uh, just for a quick background of its uh, uh, reception, the AIA uh, awarded the Heinz a National Honor Award the BSA awarded it not one, but two honor awards, one for interiors and one for architecture. And then the uh, uh, city of Boston and the BSA also gave it the uh, Harleston Parker Award, uh, a medal rather, uh, for the quote unquote most beautiful uh, recent building in greater Boston. So it, it was widely acclaimed. Uh, Paul Goldberger wrote an article about it uh, as, as one of the uh, uh, models for convention centers uh, in an article in the New York Times the uh, uh, Boston Globe, Interiors Magazine, Architecture Magazine, Progressive Architecture, you know, all, all the usual suspects uh, featured this building at the time. So despite the um, 
the fact that today it might be seen as being a uh, um, uh, you know an outmoded style, an example of modern architects uh, venturing into postmodernism uh, as a, we sort of deal with this uh, current revival of the 19th century battle of the styles you know where, where uh, if it's not uh, one style it's it's simply uh, unacceptable and 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 we can't consider it uh in terms of preservation or, or its value so i think it's important to to um take a a look and and consider the quality of it uh architectural historians naomi miller and keith morgan uh in their book boston architecture uh, 1975 to 90 uh, wrote that the Heinz uh, may be considered a breakthrough in the design of a modern building type, which actually, uh, the, this is the build modern building type, which actually advocates a kind of anti-urbanism in the heart of cities. And so what they're evaluating in that case is the fact that, that here's, a, here's a building which would normally be expected to be about as anti-urban as it could be. And anybody who's a attended conferences in, in, in other cities is well aware of that. And in this case, um, uh, clearly the, the architects essentially have, have given them, themselves the assignment to make it uh, more uh, urban and to tie it into the city the way it hadn't been. Um, well, what you're talking about, so Alan, do you have that, uh, are you able to share that uh, figure, the um, plan? Uh, sure. Um, you was, sure, happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, so this, yeah. this right. is, is actually, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see it? Where yeah. You see? yeah, yeah. No, I didn't mean to cut, cut you off, Gary. I just wanted to save time to, if you yeah. I And just the, the last point I would just make is, is that, uh, for, again, for folks who, who might not be familiar with uh, the work of, of Coleman, McKinnell, and, and Knowles, Knowles at City Hall and Coleman, McKinnell, and Wood following that, is that it, it's, they're, they're, they've been widely seen in the day as being the heirs of uh, Bullfinch and H.H. Richardson and uh, McKim from the Boston Public Library in terms of the, the importance of their buildings within the city of Boston, the way that they shaped the city of Boston. And um, I think it, it's, again, it, it's just important to, as preservationists are, are aware and as architects are aware, you know, no buildings are perfect, uh, just like uh, 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 people don't tend to be perfect. And so uh, when people are looking to uh, demolish a building or to neglect or totally overlook its uh, architectural or historical significance, there, there, there tends to be a, a, a dismissal uh, based on on imperfections of the building, so you know even Robert Campbell, who wrote a, a, one of his essays about Coleman McKinnell uh, and Noel Wood, uh, who described the building as superb, uh, still you know doesn't look at it with rose-colored glasses. So so I, I think that we have to be uh, aware that that uh, we don't need to see perfection in a building for uh, to be able to recognize its its significance or its importance and to take some. Uh, uh, make some assessment of that in the process of planning for the future of it. That's all, Jack. Thanks. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alan, for your patience. Um, Alan Mountjoy is an urban designer and architect and principal at NBBJ. Uh, oh, uh, is, I, I didn't realize I was on the, uh, on the schedule right now. I, I was actually hoping that maybe Alex could, my, my colleague, Alex, could say a few words. Uh, Absolutely. I think, my, uh, I think our, I would say my interest uh, is probably less in the architecture itself, uh, and I would I would leave it to others to discuss you know the merits of it as a as an example of Coleman McKinnell and their you know their their work of their their history of work. Uh, my uh, critique, if if you if I could call it that, would be more urbanistic in general. Um, so I maybe it'd be better to to put that off for a moment or so. Um, you, you mentioned the word almost urban. Um, so I think I, I have a few things to say about that, but I think maybe discussing, uh, maybe, maybe Alex would like to sort of start with something. But Alex, you're on mute. Well, uh, 
uh, this is not very well practiced. Alan and I have not sort of uh, orchestrated a particular session. And by the way, I'm sitting at a car dealership while my, while my car is getting serviced. So as soon as it's done, I'm saying goodbye. But uh, <laughs> so here's my dilemma. But by the way, I knew uh, Coleman McKinnell very well, first, because they're my teachers. Secondly, uh, because they became long-standing colleagues. Uh, thirdly, of course, I wrote the first monograph of their work. I know them quite well, not perhaps not, not nearly as well as uh, Rayford Law, who I noticed is there, who was their partner for many years. I certainly uh, respect a great deal of the individuals and of course uh, their, their overall oeuvre, or oeuvre of work. Uh, uh, my dilemma is the following. You know, it's one, I'm not sure any of, any of us on this call are experts in running a convention center. And that may be an issue. If it remains a convention center or some sort of a gathering for lots of people, by all means, it's got to all stay. Uh, if it's not a convention center, uh, I'm not sure why you would preserve a gigantic shed or series of sheds uh, uh, because the land there is extremely valuable. Uh, it can accommodate millions of square feet. And here I'm sounding as if I'm a developer, which I'm not, millions of square feet of space. Uh, and if it's not going to be a, a, a convention center, it is better used for many other things that the city needs, including affordable housing and, you know, the list can go on. So then the question is, what are we, what should we think about preserving? And then it becomes a matter most likely, of course, of that, of perhaps the rotunda, and of course, that sort of a facade in the first 30 feet or so of what uh, is, is used as a concourse. And then the question is, okay, how can it be reused? Uh, uh, for what purposes, how cleverly could other uses fit into that space as opposed to the spaces required for a convention, a, a, a convention facility, uh, which involves, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people uh, uh, at one time, for which it serves brilliantly. And then just perhaps to kind of anticipate what Alan might say about its sort of anti-urbanism, as a convention center in the city, it is brilliant. Uh, as a uh, very large building along a, a block, uh, the base of which is largely blank, it's not particularly uh, very urbanistically friendly. As a convention center, yes, because there's expectation that always going to be many people there. But once uh, it, that's not a convention center, boy, it is not a particularly very pleasant uh, sidewalk to walk past uh, for uh, its length. And so there are dilemmas. And again, I'm not suggesting that it should be uh, that we should not think about preserving the frontal piece and possibly, of course, the rotunda, but it becomes an, uh, but it becomes a very, if you will, sort of difficult challenge of programming uh, in relationship to the kind of millions of square feet that that uh, should be built behind it somewhere if indeed it stops being a convention center. So that's sort of my little two cents on on the subject. And I wish Rayford, Rayford would say something. He's so it's uh, too quiet back there, eh? Well, I, I appreciate that, Alex. I just, yeah. um, of course, I'm attending because I, as you infer, I do have an emotional kind of stake in the game, but also as an architect, understand that at various critical points in the life of buildings, their function is called into question or the value of that function is called into question. So um, I, I think... Um, I think it's important that to start the discourse as we are doing here to to say what what is important about the character of the building. And I want to say, you know, to um, to to all who, who have stated it, there you're pretty much on point in terms of the intent that Michael and Gerhard and a few of our uh, others of us who were working very intensely for almost three years because of course the city had this property before it was given to the state and we went through all kinds of machinations to actually switch the entrance to create perhaps a better Noli type plan um, that we're looking at today, which I think is also a very critical component in terms of its potential uh, reimagining, if you will, because for us, it was always a civic portal. It was always that moment uh, recalling the, the institutions down the street like the BPL and how it wasn't a commercial enterprise. It really was a civic one. And as, as difficult as it was, given along Boylston Street with the rise in the grade and, uh, in fact, ancient sewer pipes um, that were running next to the railroad tracks in the mass turnpike, it was a very difficult challenge to activate that facade. 
I think what we have seen subsequently over the years where various restaurants have been plugged in is the beginning of how you might think about the reuse of that. So that would be um, my take. And I appreciate uh, Alex, your, your acknowledgement. Mm. Thank you. Um, Larry, do you want, and Bob, do you want? Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much, Jack. It's a little bit like a BRA reunion. Uh, <laughs> pleasure uh, yeah. to be here and to have uh, Gary and Alex and Alan uh, chime in. I, I, uh, I, I, I think Just it's say, important yeah, to let's... have this discussion and, and um, I see Sarah Wehrmel and Anne McKinnon on here and, and, yeah. and Greg Perkins. So in Larry, any- Larry was, a, was the, the, the former BRA planner and uh, uh, chief of institutional planning at the BRA for, for many, many years, and also a uh, former principal of this, his own firm, Larry Coffin Associates, now retired. So I just want to give so, you a little introduction. Thank you. So the importance of Heinz is much more than nostalgia for great architecture. It goes to the heart of what makes the Back Bay and Heinz so significant. There's a unique synergy that has evolved over 60 years between the meeting place, the Heinz, the Back Bay location, the lodging, retail, cultural, and historic facilities, as well as national, international, commercial businesses. By way of background, as Jack said, I was a planner, Bob Crone, who's with me today, was chief architect, and we spent 10 years working on the Heinz project from 1976 to 1986. I was a planner working in collaboration with the Greater Boston Convention Tourist Bureau, the Boston Hotel Association, Back Bay Business and Neighborhood Associations, and Bob was the urban designer throughout this period. We'll undertake a joint presentation on the evolution of planning for the Heinz expansion. The end point will be the conclusion that the closure of Heinz and its proposed sale and redevelopment will negatively impact the unique synergy of meeting hotels, shopping, and tourism that is such an important part of the Back Bay, Boston's economy, and its historic character. Two activities must be immediately undertaken by the public that is concerned with the future of this facility and its economic health and the vibrancy of the Back Bay. First, a new master planning initiative must be undertaken to right-size the ownership function design of improved meeting facilities at Heinz. And second, Mayor Wu should identify commitment to protect, protecting the architecture and transferring ownership of the facility to a consortium that will undertake the studies, investment, operation, or revitalized Heinz mixed use facility. By way of background, I'm gonna introduce the space and market considerations of an expanded Heinz convention center and meeting facility and how they reflect in the Coleman McKinnell plan. And Bob Crone will talk about the early design planning of Heinz, the initial proposal to fill in the ring road. I don't know how many of you remember the ring road and that with this two-story two addition and then the Coleman McKinnell wood providing first class meeting space fronting on Boston Street Bob will show a diagram representing the state's concept for 2.3 million square feet of mixed use space on the Heinz. Doesn't leave much space for really a convention facility. It's a cash register from the state's point of view. And I'll conclude with a summary of design consideration, the neighborhood and the business community views as preconditions for the reuse of the site. Uh, the, as the current proposal is basically to close and repurpose Heinz, I wanted to provide some background design considerations in considering convention space planning, which is so essential to the fabric of the Back Bay. Uh, there are three, and we're gonna try and do this within uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes maximum. The three types of <coughs> convention meeting facilities. <coughs> Heinz is a blend. The seaport facility is a blend, but can most easily accommodate gate and trade show facilities. That, that's its, its strength. Gate show type events charge an admission fee, require large floor, area, floor areas and parking. 
A trade show is a meeting of a professional group not open to the public where registration is required and connections to hotel is, is a real plus. A convention type meeting, on the other hand, is centered around the membership of local, regional, and national organizations. The space requirements are complex. A public assembly hall, multiple meeting rooms, exhibit hall space, and connections <clears throat> to first class hotel for ballrooms, banquet, additional meeting rooms. A convention facility is a special type of architecture, which Coleman McKinnon would achieve. It's loading facilities is somewhat a little always problematic because of the turnpike underneath it. But it's assembly hall, <clears throat> meeting space, exhibit space. It has ample space for storage, truck docks, truck maneuvering, function space for registration, meetings and events, multi-use space, infrastructure, including AV technology, wireless internet access, air pressure, water, electrical con connections, Facility must be designed to accommodate oversized exhibits, large crowds, registration areas, food beverages at all scales, accommodating quick turnover and sharing of space. And it's extremely important. <clears throat> a successful convention facility like Heinz is located or was like Heinz, located with easy access to hotels, highways, rails, subways, airport, retail, cultural facilities, and Heinz is one of the few facilities in the country that has first-class hotel rooms within walking distance. <clears throat> Heinz Memorial was initially built along with the Prudential Center and a former rail yard. Prudential Shopping Center and Copley Square evolved around the synergy of expanded Heinz, what seemed like a state commitment. It seemed like a state commitment to foster economic growth of a particular type in this part of the city. Expanded Heinz was designed and right-sized to meet the diverse space needs of the Boston market, including modern meeting space to accommodate multiple small, large events of professional meetings at, this, at the same time. Substantial additional hotels, at least a thousand more class A rooms, additional retail development with the, the potential center took place assuming the continuation of Heinz. The Back Bay Association describes Heinz relation to adjacent facilities as a three to one relationship, three hotels, two shopping malls and one convention facility physically connected to create a successful convention meeting attraction in the center of the Back Bay, the city's most popular tourist attraction. <clears throat> Who has a financial inter interest in convention facilities? The hotel industry has the major interest because uh, it can leverage significant business, which is critically needed to help the 7,000 plus hotel rooms recover for the sustained economic slump, which is impacting the viabilities of these properties. Many of you may remember in the 70s, all the old uh, dormitory rooms that were being uh, closed up. The back bay was pretty much kind of deteriorated from all this earlier housing, dormitory housing stock. Maybe that'll happen again if the Heinz closes. The city in particular, state government enjoyed the benefits of convention facilities because out of town guests attending meetings spend money on hotels, shopping, restaurants. The hotel food and beverage taxes are the great benefits to the state that allowed the state to build the expanded Heinz. Interest in Heinz is much broader. All the professional associations in, around Boston and health, education, science want to one day sponsor through their chapter an event in Boston. So Heinz now, it has some 300,000 gross square feet of space. The total space is some 700,000 square feet. And it's flexible meeting space, 38 rooms, 24,000 grand ballroom, 60,000 square feet of registration, exhibit space, and a 4,000 uh, seat auditorium. So I'd like Bob Crone to uh, provide some um, some background here 
now on, on the design. You're muted. You're muted, Bob. Thanks, Jack, for uh, inviting me to participate in this. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to step back to the mid 20th century to talk about the urban design uh, opportunities that were offered by this uh, site between the South End and the Back Bay, 26 acres of uh, underutilized rail yards and the Mass Pike. In uh, 1949, John B. Hines was elected mayor of Boston, defeating James Michael Curley, who had been Boston's mayor on and off for the previous 40 years in between terms as governor, congressman, and inmate at the federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut. Governor Bradford had appointed Curley's city clerk, John B. Hines, as temporary mayor who, after professing to have no ambition to be elected mayor, but was insulted by Curley upon his return from jail, was persuaded to run against Curley in a good, on a good government platform. I was elected and uh, set about reversing the pattern of stagnation and physical decline in the city that was the result of the distrust between Curley and and the business community, and the fear that if they built anything new or even renovated existing decaying downtown buildings, they would be hit with a huge real estate tax bill, which is exactly what happened to John Hancock Life Insurance when they built their new, their new old headquarters in the Back Bay. Uh, Curley imposed high tax rates on commercial buildings in order to keep the residential tax rate low. Hines saw opportunities to jumpstart Boston's economy. The city had barely changed in 50 years, uh, with the Custom House Tower, for example, being the only tall downtown structure to jumpstart the economy with new development and transportation, housing, commercial space, and convention facilities. He initiated several major projects, uh, the redevelopment of the West End as Charles River Park, the construction of the parking garage under the Boston Common, the Central Artery and Southeast Expressway, and the mixed use development at the Prudential Center and War Memorial Auditorium in the Back Bay. And this effort was uh, largely successful with new investment following in and around each of these initiatives. But in hindsight, we see that each of these projects was fatally flawed. Uh, the West End destroyed 48 acres of urban fabrics, streets and buildings and displaced 2,500 families. The undercommon garage was scandal ridden. The central artery sliced off the city from the waterfront and from the North End. And the Prudential Center missed every opportunity to transform the Boston and Albany rail yards into a real part of the city. Uh, originally called the Back Bay Center, the architects were the architects collaborative in Walter Gropius. The 26 acre site used the Turnpike Authority's intention to extend Interstate 90 to the airport, a $100 million project into a $300 million complex of housing, retail and office space, with a major convention facility. Prudential Insurance was interested in the project, but backed away when the Supreme Judicial Court issued the ruling more than once that Prudential's effort to peg their tax exposure to the market price, not the assessed valuation of the site, would be unconstitutional. But Prudential needed the assurance that they would not be treated like Hancock and finally got the SJC's blessing in 1953 
to limit their tax liability to 20% of revenues over $3 million a year. Quaint, isn't it? It's one $3 million seemed like a lot of money. The design Prudential and their architect, Charles Luckman, came up with failed in many ways to realize an extraordinary urban design opportunity to knit the street grid of the back bay with the grid of the south end, to extend pedestrian traffic along Boylston Street and Huntington Avenue across the site, to extend retail frontage at street level along the edges of the site, and to relate this to the scale and character of the surrounding city. Instead, the design adheres to many principles of what was considered to be good urbanism in the 1950s, to separate pedestrians from vehicles for safety, to keep different uses separate from one another, housing, office, retail, convention facilities for security, to build tall buildings in order to provide open space in the form of plazas at the base of the tower, Corbusier's towers in the park notion. As a result, these principles produced a scheme where no streets penetrated the sites to tie it with either the back bay or the south end. Uh, retail use is separated and disjoined from both Boylston Street and Huntington Avenue by the Ring Road. The shops were located not as a continuation of those on Boylston Street, but in a configuration perpendicular to the Boylston Street shops and further separated from the fabric of the Back Bay by being raised to a plaza level above the normative sidewalk. The War Memorial Auditorium also was set back from the city streets, raised to the plaza level, and included no uses at the lower level to promote and supplement pedestrian activity. The Prudential Center, because of its height, and the auditorium, because of its bulk, made no attempt to relate to the scale of the Back Bay or the architectural character of Boston. And the so-called open space was the very definition of the dusty, windswept, vacant plaza. So these are the issues that Coleman and McKinnell uh, raised in their scheme for the expansion of the Heinz Auditorium in which they addressed. Locating the facility on the Ring Road, not behind it, to extend the street wall of Boylston Street, uh, putting the main entrance on Boylston Street to stimulate pedestrian activity. Locating the primary circulation space inside the building behind large windows along the Boylston Street facade to bring views of the convention center activity out to the street and to bring views of the city into the building, putting the city on display as an exhibit itself and relating the project to the city with compatible materials and overcoming the impact of the building size through the use of scaling elements and bay spacing that's similar to the back bay, uh, reflecting the low slung tennis and racket club directly across Boylston Street from the Hines. The racket club is where Coleman and McKinnell had their offices. Thank you. Bob, you have, uh, I sent the, some of the graphics of the proposed development of 2.5 million square feet. Hmm. You have those and you have the... the... We'll see if I can screen share. It's obvious from the state's planning that they're, they want to uh, generate as much revenue as possible. They've shown a, a, a mixed use plan, so-called, and somehow 
they think they can accommodate some convention space. That that's the uh, two point three million square feet. One option has labs, but it's office and residential. And basically, they've showed uh, through some financial analysis that the benefits of this would be uh, greater than continuing Heinz. The basic fact is that uh, the state convention center authority has taken the business from Heinz and brought it over to the seaport district. Um, but um, the proposed plan doesn't reflect any sense of convention market needs. 150,000 square feet will not be adequate. And the section of plan do not represent a serious commitment to preserve the existing frontage. The Back Bay Association and the Neighborhood Association have developed some guidelines for the reuse of the property. Um, one is that any, uh, anything constructed on a air rights over the turnpike is subject to the city of Boston zoning code. A civic advisory committee should be appointed any building on harm should not cast additional shadows on Com Ave. And in order to maximize the value of the meeting space, inter internal connection to the Prudential Center must be maintained. These are not very bold recommendations. Uh, frankly, the hotels in, in the Back Bay in the city are in a huge slump now. And the convention market is an important opportunity to leverage uh, and build back the loss of that vitality. So I think what's important is that for Mayor Wu and the Back Bay and the neighborhood to uh, develop a private consortium which uh, would undertake the necessary market studies um, and land use studies to develop a plan for, uh, for this part of the city, reusing the space where possible, uh, but keeping as much of the convention market connected to the hotels so that uh, there's a viable plan for this part of the city. Um, Bob, I don't know whether you wanna show any of the early images Hoping it's okay to show those. That's a, I say, confidential draft, but. <laughs> uh, maybe you could talk about that, Bob. That's uh, you're muted. Huh. This uh, appears to show the delicate touch of Michael McKinnell in this pencil rendering. And uh, it was pretty much, this was their earlier scheme, uh, pretty much addressing all of the issues that I've just talked about. In other words, putting, locating the building on the ring road in a low slung uh, structure that related in scale and base spacing uh, to uh, uh, the character of the back bay, but also suggesting uh, grand uh, railroad halls of earlier centuries. Um, Just leave it there. Yeah, the uh, the XO still, so the uh, steel yes. work is wonderful. Uh, well, there's not like, there's also the the image that shows the Heinz in the context of Boylston Street, in the library. Yes, and if I could just interject, this was the original scheme for the city that shows the entrance at the intersection of Dalton and Boylston, as opposed to down opposite. 
uh, Gloucester Street. Correct. And the detailing of the roof overhangs is fascinating. And looking like these outriggers and uh, I'm really going back to seems like ancient uh, Greece or, or Rome. That's for what for me, and I've always loved the building. Not you know, not as a sort of an expert or historian, you know, as to whether this was a uh, delving into postmodernism or whatever, but to me it always just seemed very timeless, and it's uh, the way the uh, the suggestions of architectural forms going kind of sort of pre pre classicism. <laughs> well, I guess I can you get that um, image of Boston Street? Let me see if I can. And thank you, by the way, Bob, for your, I was muted before, but uh, thank you for your, your great uh, giving us that background and you know, well-spoken history and we learned a lot. Um, maybe maybe this is a good time for me to say say a few things about um, you know our perceptions from urban design and Bob Coring. Good to good to see you again. Um, uh, you know, putting I guess putting aside this question of is the facility viable as a convention center, um, which I, I know part of your your thrust is to say that it's still valid. Um, I think one of the things we looked at was. Uh, how could this building be a better uh, uh, neighbor on the street? There certainly is a risk here of a building that has infrequent or periodic use tends to be a bit of a black a black box. Um, and we certainly in Boston understand how um, things like Fenway Park can be made active along its edges, even though it's not a busy facility all the time. So fixing the edges of this building seems to be part, I would suggest, would be part of one of the solutions that you'd want to come up with. And I don't know if it was Bob who mentioned that, you know, there has been various uh, reuses of the base of the building, the Capitol Grill and other uses that have uh, begun to inhabit some of that arcade space that in general is not really very usable for retail space. And, and then of course, we all know that the big drop off in the front is a little deadly to the pedestrian experience, especially if there's nothing going on there. It's a space you kind of rush to get past uh, because it's really not part of your sort of, it, it's not a pleasant urban experience when you walk along there. So I guess I've been a little bit um, convinced in this call that there is probably a way to renovate the front of this building, whether or not there's a um, an activity that is a convention center behind, in front or in back. I wanted to share uh, because we had um, the, the work we had done was probably a little bit more accepting of the removal of the building, and I just wanted to pick up something that Bob Croyne had talked about which was um, the initial building itself was, uh, or I should say the, the Prudential Center in general was somewhat hostile. Uh, I think, Bob, you have to stop sharing while I, if I wanna share, so. Um. Call from Brad. So um, I think one of the things that we noted as we were, you know, and you, and you called out quite legitimately is the, the length of the uninterrupted superblock that is uh, the Prudential Center. Um, and then of course, the, the first thing we did was say, well, um, here's a, what if one were to install, reinstall Gloucester Street as a connection uh, through the block to create a smaller superblock? The opportunity for that uh, with a redevelopment of the site would be rather phenomenal. Uh, and of course, I sort of jokingly put the little bit of the back bay fabric through here, which of course is not what would happen by any means. 
but the idea of extending the street grid through the site has certain appeal from an urbanistic point of view um, by breaking down the scale of the super block uh, and fixing what I think was always a bit of a flaw in the in the envisioning. So I, I just wanted to point out that that uh, some of our initial thoughts were not about saving the building and what the opportunities were if you did not save the building. So that may sound like uh, a, apostasy in this group, but um, that's where that's where we were coming from. Uh, just to provide a radical alternative viewpoint, uh, I, I feel like I'm going to be chased out of the temple any moment. But uh, that was that was where we were coming from. Yeah. So, no, not at all. The extension of Gloucester Street was, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a consideration. Alan, you had some an earlier diagram that showed its location and the development of uh, Dalton Street site, which is the air rights. Correct. And I don't know why people don't focus on developing that air rights. The, the reason why Heinz is not fully occupied is because the Mass State Convention Facility in the Seaport District, it's a state facility and they've taken the conventions that wanna be in Boston, they've taken, they've moved them out to the very impersonal Seaport District. But there's nothing to say that the Heinz facility does is not the location and doesn't have the elements of operating very viable uh, conventions that the hotels, which never got built in the Seaport District, uh, really depend upon. I, I would not want to engage in any sort of economic conversation with anybody about this. I just know that the state wants to get rid of it. Uh, that's, uh, I, I'm not an economist, so I have no idea whether that's but Speaking of urban design, though, I think you've shown that Dalton Street site really has potential. I don't know why the state doesn't focus on the viability of that location as opposed to uh, cannibalizing Heinz. And I understood the mayor is thinking of putting some kind of a, a school or something may possibly in the Heinz. I, I don't, do you provide any kind of a role with the state or you're just working on your own to come up with some some broader concepts. Oh, uh, why did we? Why did we do these? Why did we? Uh, why did we look at this at all? Um, yeah. uh, primarily uh, for the purposes of you know being being architects and urban designers, because uh, there is likely to be a design commission here to redevelop this site. So, uh, from from a particular strictly mercenary point of view, we're looking to uh, Boston Properties as an obvious choice, uh, given that they own the, the, the Prudential Center to expand their footprint uh, to the West. I would hope that the uh, Neighborhood Association and the Business Association, the hotels that have so much investment uh, would stimulate a planning process that really addressed uh, substantive economic development issues as well as architectural issues. Well, you know, I guess the only thing, I, the only the only response I would give to that is that right now in Boston, life science is the lifeblood of development, and South Boston, the seaport, has become quite vibrant because of all of the life science that is down there. Cambridge, uh, Kendall Square is quite vibrant because of all the life science and the mix of residential with life science. So I, I only suggest that the back bay is left out of the economic opportunities that are sprouting up everywhere else. Uh, and as a perhaps as an, a counter argument to the convention center, a series of of very active office buildings doing lab science, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's objections, plenty of objections to the idea of, of chemicals near residences, but in Kendall Square, that is, that is certainly what is, is fueling an absolutely uh, a robust economy and highest dollars in both the seaport and in Kendall Square, and it's not happening in Back Bay.
Any other thoughts? Comments? Ideas? Thinking about all those coffee shops over in Kendall Square. And good restaurants too, I might add. Yeah. Although yeah. Italy is fabulous. So it's a good reason to go to the Back Bay for sure. I, I could see Italy wanting to expand into this space by all means. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's, uh, Bob Crone, do you want to show some of the earlier slides, uh, the evolution of the Back Bay, which is certainly unique space. Kendall Square has emerged in its own way. I'm not sure why the Back Bay would want to become like Kendall Square, but. Um, I only say that because I think the, the, the potential reuse of that site may very well, nobody's building office buildings. Uh, so if somebody were to anticipate reusing that site, it might very possibly be life science. Well, uh, I'd suggest the Dalton Street site, maybe that would be life science, but the existing Heinz. So what side of what side of Dalton are you guys talking about? For the well, site? So uh, next to the hotel? Alan, Alan had that picture referred to as the dead space over the bridge. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. You, you mean the air oh, rights, air, air the right. air rights oh, site. Correct, right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, air rights have been tough for quite some time in Boston. We're finally seeing some development of air rights just to the west of Mass Ave. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Um, with, and that's not life science, that's office and residential. So there is hope for air rights. Uh, and this is an ideal site, uh, certainly over the transit, uh, over, over the green line. So uh, I certainly hope that someday that site will be developed. Um, and who knows for what, but it's, there's not a lot of space there. Uh, it's hemmed in by the parking garage on Dalton and, and such. So it's right. relatively modest footprint. When Bob was talking about the, the, uh, the early, the Prudential, uh, I flashed back to uh, when I was in the, I don't know, sixth grade or seventh grade, making my way in with one of my friends from the suburbs, from Lexington, probably about 77 bus through Arlington Heights and all over for our, our kids' adventure in Boston. And we came to this spot. And I remember going up to that isolated plaza where there were the pools and the fountains and all that. And we were accosted by some Boston tough kids, um, <laughs> probably our age, but... Um, <laughs> But they were they were toughies compared to me anyway. And I remember being chased, running back towards Boylston Street, running down the up escalator. <laughs> so, so that was my sort of traumatic, you know, uh, childhood experience from uh, visiting the Prudential Complex. Wow, you weren't even in Southie to get beat up. Right. Wow. Larry, is this? Uh... One well, of the that, diagrams that you wanted me to put out. Well, I mean, that, you know, Bob is modest and uh, his goal was to fill in the ring road and it really started all this development that we subsequently seen. But there's a diagram also showing uh, the initial plan that we worked on, uh, showing the uh, it was going to be a $30 million project showing uh, exhibit space, uh, new meeting space in that shaded area over the ring road. Then Coleman McKinnell got retained and they came up with the, uh, the much greater vision for Heinz. And there, I think the, uh, the diagram that shows Boylston Street with the, the library and the uh, I mean, think, I think Coleman McKinnell's design vision had the, all of Boston Street as a context. Of course, there's been so much more development along Boston Street. Do you, do you have that? 
I would say, Larry, that you're correct, that we were clearly looking from, um, well, from the from Boylston Street, from Hereford, all the way down to Dartmouth and, and Clarendon, if you will, as um, at least at the time, and it has certainly been redeveloped over the past years, somewhat of a dynamic street, different than the streets of Back Bay, because it did demarcate clearly and not negatively the sort of civic and commercial presence in Back Bay at the scale that was commensurate, as I would say, uh, with the intention on behalf of the BRA at the time to make it a large area. This is the original air rights property, um, which is part of the opportunity, I guess, that um, if I may paraphrase, the mercenaries are looking at. So I think that that the idea would be that um, that this was still, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't to the extent to which it was a, a black hole. And that was our design intent was to make sure that the life of the street was present to the extent to which we could make that. And the idea of that arcade, that 30 foot bar was the exchange to see visibility and to see back bay. I think then it's really one for us of, is it incompatible to say that a convention center of a modest size that is uh, appropriate to the scale of the city that it fronts upon, and that would be Back Bay, Newbury Street, Commonwealth Avenue, uh, et cetera. Is it, is it um, irreconcilable with other commercial development uses um, that might help to activate it? I just, I'm not sure that it's a mutually exclusive proposition and may, by virtue of the question, suggest that uses that might not be appropriate. I wouldn't say that offices and labs are by default inappropriate, um, it does seem that we can get on the lab bandwagon and find ourselves with a city full of labs. And I think we just have to temper what we think are the opportunities for this very prominent site. Um, and and what, is, um, what is the character, what is the vibrancy that we can get? I, I think that would be possible. I think the extent to which you can build millions of square feet over the existing Hines or over the turnpike and the railroad tracks are possible. I think it's one of, does it exclude that there's a presence, a, a presence on the street that isn't necessarily residential like Back Bay? Because in, in some ways, the, the hotel, the Mandarin, is saying that you can have residential like, but in fact, it's still commerce. So I'm just, it's going to be a programming issue as well as the financial feasibility, the pro forma of what is it that we can do here. I know that the thinking was always with the MCCA, I'm not going to speak economics, but the idea was in order to stay competitive, the big facility was built out um, by the channel, right out in the seaport, and that that had a particular target, the very, very large annual conventions, um, political conventions, trade shows, et cetera. But the Heinz was modeled on the idea that Boston also could attract those smaller ones. And I, when you look online, you see they're still booking there, you know, things like the Yankee Dental Congress or small um, small, I'll say medical or related conventions that weren't large enough to justify the, the big facility in the seaport, but were quite convenient to the institutions that were here within the city. So I, I guess I offer that as some sort of response to say that um, the idea of development or redevelopment here doesn't seem to make sense with the elimination of that function per se. Um, and that might be a way to, to, to think about it. Yeah, I think um, what happened is they built the large gate show facility in part because nothing was happening out in the seaport district and they were hoping that that would stimulate growth. Initially, the politics in South Boston, they didn't want all the traffic, auto traffic from gate and trade shows, but that has dissipated. So basically the seaport facility is suitable for the large gate and trade show um, that come to Boston. The World Trade Center is being repurposed. The uh, private facility that was over and uh, next to UMass, uh, that, that trade show facility has passed. So the Seaport District can attract the very large conventions um, and gate and trade shows, but there's still a law, a very large national, international and regional market to come to Boston. It's, it's a unique location 
for that kind of facility. And um, I think, I don't know whether the mayor can really get her and, and who's ever going to run the BRA can really organize a marketing planning process to right size the Heinz. It, it needs to be privately owned because the city did not have the money to build the new Heinz, the expanded Heinz. They were in a financial crisis. They sold the undercommon garage. They sold Heinz. They sold other parking facilities to raise cash. So with the state takeover, the city's interests have been bypassed and the city really needs to look at what its interest is and work with the hotel industry in the neighborhood to uh, develop um, a viable scheme. What the sh state is showing here, potential site massing is really just justification for trying to show that the site is worth an enormous amount of money. I guess I'm trying to understand um, whether this group, uh, the, 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 the position is more about preserving the function of the facility or is it preserving the architecture of the facility? Because it seems to me that the iconic nature of the architecture is actually the work that was done on the outside along Boylston Street. It's the kind of iconic shape. And do you, the rest of it is all just kind of, uh, other. There, there are the cylinders, of course, um, but is it preserving the entire facility intact or is it really more about the architectural features that you want to be preserved in a, perhaps a much smaller version or a repurposed version. I, I, the position, I'm confused about the position that you're taking. Is it, is it an economic position or is it an architectural position? Well, well, uh, well, it's a good question, <laughs> I guess, to, about the interior and exterior and all that. But just to clarify as to when you say this group, if you mean our uh, committee is that uh, we are not, uh, we're not, in an advocacy role and we're not representing the BSA or the BSA board and all, we're just having the discussions and we certainly have our interests and our professional biases <laughs> and our designer biases and all. So I know, I mean, the reason I was intrigued by the whole Noli sort of thing was that uh, I love the, the exterior public realm, but also it has the inside out sort of public realm, the interior sense of the promenade through and that version of extending interior streets. So but we don't have, we're not taking any particular position. I guess I almost have to say that just uh, on behalf of, because committee chairs are not, uh, are not actually permitted to uh, provide advocacy positions that haven't been cleared by the BSA board and all stuff. So we're, this is just for our, our sort of academic for discussion and education and all, and certainly I see, because Larry yeah. sounded sounded like Larry was writing a uh, position piece of some sort. Well, uh, what I'd like to see the role of this committee or BSA is to point out the um, the importance of the functions that currently take place at Heinz and the myth that you can somehow easily incorporate those activities into a kind of massing scheme of mixed uses of residential and biolab that the state is showing really for the purpose of justifying the market value. Uh, but I think it's up to the Back Bay neighborhood and business community and, and a group such as yourself, which is concerned about architecture to undertake a planning process to identify what aspects of the market can best be continue to be served at Heinz and how the architecture can be refashioned to incorporate that part of the market while also accommodating some new development. But I think the assumption that if the state had their way that it would have anything to do with the quality of the design of that building and the historic quality of the back bay is uh, an illusion. The state has no interest 
in retaining the architecture and it has no interest in really doing anything that's of importance to the historic qualities and investment that's been going on in the back bay. I would only point to the Hurley building as an interesting parallel example of what is going on at the state uh, in a disposition process for a historically relevant or a very historic building uh, at the Hurley building, which is the state is, uh, uh, DCAM is undergoing a decom decommissioning process of that building uh, to a private developer uh, that is in mid process. Uh, and it's been quite a process and there were studies on the historic uh, relevance and uh, features of the building that was done in advance of the state putting that putting that site on on for sale. So fortunately, I think that's why I think that's why uh, uh, we are in this historic resources committee, um, um, Alan and, and Jack. You, you, while you, there are certain restrictions that the BSA uh, imposes on the. Uh, uh, committee members and, and the, the committee chairs at this point in time. Uh, you know, it's worth recalling that when uh, Mayor Menino was threatened into uh, sell off the uh, city hall, uh, because uh, again, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a looking at public resources, the common, common uh, wealth as being there to take advantage of economically. And that's, that's the goal. Also possibly at that time, he was hoping to uh, jumpstart the, uh, the, the work on the seaport again. So there are ulterior motives that, that, that drove the, the idea. But uh, the, the BSA did not uh, take a, a position on that. The AIA National uh, was prepared to uh, uh, do whatever it needed to do in terms of making, uh, making statements about that. So we have to realize that, that, that our organization of the AIA in Boston uh, you know, is closely tied to to uh, the development, and many of our firms, of course, are are, are supported that way and have have significant uh, income coming from uh, uh, public projects and or and or developer projects. The purpose of the Historic Resources Committee, as I see it, is to say we have historic resources. Those are something that uh, the the city and all of us taxpayers all are, are uh, benefit from and uh, we've seen uh, over the centuries uh, people ignoring uh, the value of our cultural heritage in order to uh, uh, provide uh, uh, new ideas and sometimes they're terrific and sometimes they're not and there's a, there's a balance there but uh, there hasn't necessarily been uh, um, a, a attempt to uh, look at the broader issues involved other than financial development and real estate profits. And uh, I think our, our committee is saying there are other values that need to be concerned here. Yes, the state wants to uh, maximize revenue despite the fact that there's a huge, huge uh, surplus at the moment. They can't figure out how to spend the money that we've got. And uh, uh, the fact is that uh, there are other values that uh, we as architects and as citizens and as taxpayers uh, hold uh, to be important rather than simply uh, uh, maximizing the return on any piece of uh, the city. And so that, that's what we're concerned about. That's what we're debating. And I think, uh, Alan, uh, we, we are not allowed, we're actually not allowed, uh, Jack is not allowed to make a statement. So this is simply a forum for us to say, uh, these are values that we uh, hold to be important. And there's nobody else uh, who's tasked with this, who volunteers to, to, to be engaged in this effort. And that's what we do. Yeah. Thank if you, I'm Gary. Not, yeah. And then I'm certainly that we advocate. Uh, and we, we certainly advocate for good design and for preservation. Uh, so Jack, and Jack, if I might interject. Yes, great. Um, I realized that when I was chair of the codes committee, that is an advocacy committee. Um, but I would suggest that you are much too modest. I think Gary is right that the this is a forum for discussing issues of advocacy that can yeah. then be reported up to the, the board of the BSA, and then they can take the appropriate action. But I would suggest that uh, when we see something that requires of us as professionals to speak out 
and advocate for something, we should not be bashful about it. We can formulate it in, in, in this forum uh, in such a way as to uh, provide the fuel uh, and the background for the board to then take that to the next step. But I wouldn't shy away from trying to talk about issues of advocacy. I think it's really incumbent upon us uh, from the perspective of the historic resources to, to bring that focus to, to this entire, and to all the issues we've been discussing here. So that, for example, Alan's images uh, of, of design options, I think that the history that Larry presented and Bob presented, I think that's really a fantastic background for us to then try to shape some kind of recommendations to the board, even if it's only in an embryonic uh, form, it's not that we have to come up with an advocate, advocated position, but that we can come up with a bunch of issues that are of uh, professional uh, uh, importance to us. So I, I would not shy away from that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't let the BSA, uh, the way the BSA's mandate, I wouldn't let that hamstring us we are we are committed com professionals, and that's really our first obligation. Thank you, Trey. Yeah, you, I hear you. You're right, <laughs> and Gary. Yeah, the truth is, I have uh, shied away uh, just from uh, a couple of instances where I drafted a letter and it was, re it was retracted, <laughs> that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, I have. I admit I sort of shied away, but you're right. It's uh, it's not that. Uh, we needed to send out a press release on our own, uh, but to take it up the ladder so uh, and still uh, can convey our, our concern. And, and, uh, and thank you, for Bob and Larry, for uh, uh, giving us that background and for the persuasive arguments uh, expressing some of those concerns. So um, I guess we should let people get, uh, get back to work at this point, unless anyone has any. Well, I would only suggest oh, that um, AIA Mass does have an advocacy uh, position. Uh, they have a, 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 a lobbyist, basically, um, that is their, their job is to talk to legislators on issues of importance to the AIA or provide a, a resource for that uh, at the board level. Uh, and then I guess the only other question, only uh, the other point I'd like to make is that the, the, the new uh, director of the BRA will be coming in in mid-May, um, yeah. Arthur Jemison. Uh, so he will be fresh fresh from Detroit. Uh, I don't know what his priorities will be, but he will probably, this will be one of the issues that uh, the city will want to, you know, opine on, uh, have their say. And in the past, the last thing I would say is the BSA has not been shy about doing charrettes and uh, workshops of a design nature in the past on projects that they felt were super important, like the uh, Alston Yards uh, projects and other projects where, where design charrettes have been managed uh, in order to further the, uh, the, the concepts or further the conversation. I, uh, I applaud that. Uh... Thinking, Alan, I, I recall working on the Fort Devens reuse, which was a phenomenal effort led by uh, the uh, Boston Society of Architects. So I, I urge this committee, Gary, thank you, uh, Rayford, Drake. I see some of the gray hairs here, the ones that are more inclined to be advocates. That, that's something to note. But I really encourage uh, Jack to uh, move this issue up the flagpole. And um, in a prior editorial in the Globe, they identified Arthur Jameson as the point person for the mayor. And she has some ideas. I really think this ought to be a key issue when you meet with, uh, with uh, Arthur Jameson that you discuss where he is on this and did you, you offer your services. There's, there's clearly leadership here that is needed and uh, BSA has shown the ability to do that. And I hope you'll step forward. 
One of the yeah. problems that we have in the BSA, there is no committee on urban design at all. So the issue comes up sort of through the back door. So it's not, I don't think it's fair to Jack that we all start dumping on him about problems of urban design and saving some of the classic buildings, but I don't have any other way of recommending it. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the um, hotel that's being built over by the, uh, the convention center now. Um, that went through a process of, of a competition. There were four developers who presented their schemes and the, the urban design issues took a backseat to the selection of the final designs. Uh, I know because I was one of the reviewers uh, and I pushed heavily for uh, focusing on the urban issues, uh, not just on the hotel issues. And what the governor decided is that uh, the economics of the hotel uh, could not be uh, supplemented by the state in, in any way, but there was an opportunity uh, in an urban design sense to integrate the hotel with the new parking garage that's built uh, almost immediately next to it. Uh, and one of the schemes did do that. And I think that uh, we need to develop some forum, uh, maybe some other committee that will advocate for issues of urban design. Uh, maybe Alan, you want to take that on? <laughs> well, there is an urban design uh, group out there, uh, but I don't know how active they are right now. There is there is a committee on urban design, but I, I'm not part yeah. of it. Yeah, I was going to say I was surprised because I thought there used to be anyway. But yeah, the charrette is uh, wonderful. That's a great idea, and um, so uh, well, let's definitely stay stay tuned and. Um, and I thank you for the you know, for the advice and uh, for the great ideas. So, well, I, I would only just say Tad Reed has been uh, sort of involved in the past in charrettes uh, at the B at the at the BPDA. I don't know who is you know they, they've undergone a lot of transitions over the last couple of uh, years. A lot of people have left, uh, so it's a new crew. And I think when Arthur Jemerson comes on, it'll be even a new crew. I would just suggest starting at the top huh, with them uh, and get an audience. Uh, I'm yeah. sure everyone will you get in line because <laughs> yeah, everyone's well, we, going to want to talk to him. Yes, and we certainly wish him success. And, uh, and it's great that he's had his Boston you know, experience before working in Boston. So, yes, yes. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, this has been great. And so just by way of announcement, uh, for a totally different scale, by the way, the um, residential, BSA Residential Design Committee is actually doing uh, noontime today. So moving quickly, but they actually had a kind of sent out to our mailing list, if you haven't already seen it, uh, they're doing a session at noon called Do's and Don'ts of, for, for Historic houses, I guess. So Historic New England is their featured speaker uh, to give some advice. So anyway, if you want more uh, at, a, at that residential scale, uh, tune in to a noontime meeting. Should be on the calendar. Uh, it was sort of late added to the calendar, I think, just like ours was. So thanks, everyone. Okay. Well, and I, we'll, Bob and we'll I circle back. Bob and I thank wanted to you. thank you all for the chance to uh, talk a bit about this important history and I hope some of the gray hairs work with you Jack and uh, and, and and get something going on uh, all right we will yeah we will talk offline as they say okay the way, Al, Alan thank you you are correct Very much. there is an urban design committee and um, there are two people one of them from Sasaki are the current chairs um, I guess we should look into it <laughs> good idea Good idea. Okay. Nice to meet you, Alan. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Bye bye. Thanks again. Thank bye you. All. Thank you.